Would you like to talk more about sex? If you wish to. <laughs> I, you're very physically active. You, you really rush for it. Are we still talking about sex? Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes, my glasses just fell. That I, means I'm, I, I'm abandoning I, this I, beautifully crafted set of questions. I take that as a great compliment that your glasses fell off. You see, when oh, you're 60, yeah. that's a compliment. Oh, okay. <laughs>Good evening, everyone. My name is Yvonne Hunter, as most of you know, I believe, and I am the head of programming here at the Appel Salon at the Toronto Public Library. Hold on to your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to have some fun with two of Canada's great conversationalists. Trailing our distinguished author in age by a few years, and not too many, I hasten to add, I think of tonight as fun for all ages, because an excerpt, just a single sentence, in fact, from his latest book, Had My Friends and Me Spitting Out Our Breakfast Cereal. <laughs> Two weeks ago, the author said in the Globe, I walked into the bathroom at work, entered a stall, secured the door, and proceeded to unbutton my shirt. <laughs> the award-winning author and Globe and Mail feature writer Ian Brown is here with a new book and a big question. 60, is it the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning? And joining him from Victoria, BC, is the CBC's Sheila Rogers, Chancellor at UVic, champion of Canadian books and writers, and one of the warmest, most beloved voices in radio. Tradition says the 60th year is the diamond year, five short years away from official retirement and discounted TTC fare. <laughs> 60 usually straddles somewhere between embracing the empty nest and deciding whether to dread life's next stage, or really take it by the horns. What started as a Facebook post on his 60th birthday eventually grew into this wickedly funny, brutally honest play-by-play -play of Ian's 61st year. As my mother-in-law says, getting old isn't for sissies. Tonight we'll tap into Ian's wisdom, yes, another cliched advantage of growing older, and explore the truths and misadventures of 60 and the great beyond. Ian is going to open tonight with a reading, and then Sheila uh, will be joining him in conversation on stage. Please join me with a warm welcome for Ian Brown and Sheila Rogers. Thank you. Are you sure you wouldn't like to stand up here with me? I, I, would, enjoy, I would enjoy that more, I think. Uh, thank you very much. It's a huge um, honor uh, and thrill uh, to be here. Um, I'm, I'm supposed to give a, a short reading. Um, normally, nonfiction writers do not read their work. It is not considered proper um, because it's not made up. So if the reading is not good and it's an, a novelist, you can just say, oh, well, he was having an off day. His imagination wasn't really working that day. But if a nonfiction writer reads something that you don't like, you think, I don't like him. <laughs> so it's, it's dangerous. Anyway, I'm going to read you two very quick things. And then um, this, is, uh, this is a diary of the year I, well, I turned 60 and I wrote something and I put it on Facebook and it felt uh, unusual. And I thought I'd do it again each day and I kept writing. And so this, this is the uh, a diary of the year uh, from my 60th birthday to my 61st. And this is um, part of an entry from uh, May 22nd. I have to put my glasses on because I now need glasses <laughs> because I'm over 60. Before we headed off on this jaunt to Britain, I visited my insurance agent. I have something like half a million dollars coverage, which seems like a hell of a lot, especially when I have to pay a premium that leaves me broke every month, and thus deeper and deeper into a line of credit, and closer and closer to fatal heart disease, to judge from the actual electrical buzz I experience in my balls and chest every time I look at my bank overdraft. So I raised the possibility with my insurance agent of cutting my premium by more than two-thirds and my coverage to $150,000. I mean, look, I am going to be dead. 
That amount would still pay the immediate debts and the funeral costs and give Johanna, my wife, a year of income. This too is love, baby. She'll own the house. She'll have my pension, such as it is, my RRSP, such as it is. I need to cut back because my income is not increasing, as noted. I've had two increases at the Globe in six years, each one 3%, which comes down to 1% a year for six years, not compounded and not equivalent to inflation. My insurance agent is happy to help out, but she also thinks I need to find new sources of income <laughs> at 60. Are you familiar with the kids on YouTube, she says, 10 minutes into the meeting. I'm coming off a hideous knock-me-down cold, the first I've had in years, another bad sign, and want to decapitate her on the spot. Her name is Jody, with an I. She's a perfectly fine person, a friend, and she has been a good advisor, but this telling me to look to YouTube for a living, decapitation did come to mind. But of course, I did not decapitate her because I am an older person now, and I should listen to the young hipsters who think they know everything. So instead, I say, which ones on YouTube? And she rattles off a pair of kids who make a science show, which is really good in teaching kids about science, she says. She claims they're making between half a million and a million dollars a year on YouTube. The implication is clear. If I weren't such a stiff old fuck up, I could be making half a mil on YouTube, which is so unlikely someone should write a pop song about it. There are very few of those people, I point out, but she then claims to have met 10 of them. Who else, I demand? By now I have my notebook and pen out and I'm writing shit down. <laughs> well, I don't want to violate their privacy. Don't be ridiculous, I'm not going to tell anyone. Well, she says, those two guys in Montreal, the bacon guys who cook bacon all the time on YouTube, they make me ill, but they make over a million a year. She means Harley Morenstein and Sterling Toth who are 25 and 27 and created the weekly online bow down to gluttony called Epic Mealtime. They have 360,000 followers who subscribe to their YouTube channel and about 34 million views, easily topping a million views an episode. One of their Thanksgiving creations was a turkey, a duck, a chicken, a Cornish hen, and a quail stuffed into a 20-pound piglet. They cemented it with mashed bacon and pork sausage and the like to the point where it created a feast of just over 79,000 calories. <laughs> their hope is to monetize their concept so that they do not have to return to graphic design and supply <laughs> teaching. I admire them. Really, I do. They must be having a blast and they are obviously energetic guys with a knack for popular fare. I am just surprised that my insurance agent, Jody, was pushing me to emulate them. I can't really see a YouTube channel called An Old Guy Who Loves Bacon. <laughs> Perhaps I could do An Old Guy Who Doesn't Like Anything and Is Old Before His Time. But my agent isn't done with me. Soon she is talking about how the future is changing so much and so fast, and how she is reading Peter Diamandis's books, Abundance and Bold, about the world's five greatest problems, and how we are going to solve them with, quote, solar panels the size of a fingernail that can heat an entire village, unquote. But of course, I resist all this. I resist books like Abundance and Bold on principle because A, I loathe intellectual certainty and they traffic in it, and B, they're successful, and C, such books generally read poorly, though bold isn't bad because they aren't written elegantly with an eye to the quality of the prose, and that's what matters to me. I realize this is old-fashioned and defensive and asinine and likely counterproductive and self-destructive too. This is the view of an aging man. But I can't respect the ideas of anyone who won't make at least an effort to say something in a way that brings the reader some pleasure or awe. But then again, it is the height of idleness to decry the present. Whatever else you say about it, the present is unavoidably real and here in front of our eyes. I think Martin Ame has said as much in one of his books, I can't remember which one, because I'm 60. 
And if there are people living in the present who believe they can predict the future, all the better for them. I prefer to describe the present. It feels more human to me. It is something I can see with my own eyes, hear with my own ears. It is what I have more of. It has the distinct texture of the here and now, and it resists simplistic analysis. It requires holding contradictory ideas in the brain at the same time without having a nervous breakdown. And I think that's good for my 60-year-old brain. The present beats the future. But of course, I would say that, wouldn't I? But on the way home from the insurance agents, I have an idea. I'll finish this effing diary, and then I'll create my own YouTube channel. I'll call my show, Ow, What Happened? <laughs> and on it, I will describe while applying the hemorrhoid ointment to my nethers and chowing down on Metamucil, what it feels like to be 60 in a world that doesn't want to admit that one day it is going to be 62. Thank you very much. Nicely done, really. Thank you. And you know, you. you're such a beautiful writer, I almost hate to talk to you. I mean, I just, uh, you know, just keep on reading. However. Well, it's, it's lovely to see you. I haven't seen you in, uh, since talking books. And how am I holding up? Yeah, you know. <laughs> I would say very well. well thank very you. Well. <laughs> you. No visible means of support. Your glasses aren't on. <laughs> <laughs> no visible means of support. Oh my God, that's wonderful. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to, to do this conversation. Right, well, how could I say no to this? Well, thank you. And, and thank you also for being here. And I just, I just want to also acknowledge my producer, Jacqueline Kirk, who is also here. That's very important to me. And to tell you this is being recorded for the next chapter. So, you know, don't hold back, okay? I mean, if, if you feel like laughing, don't laugh like you just did now. Okay, just a, a little bit more. Here's the thing, okay, here's the thing about me and Ian. I've known Ian, I've known you, since before I was 40. And I went to your 40th birthday party yes. in a maid's costume. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, uh, no, yes. <laughs> I was in a maid's costume. There was a maid's costume. I was dressed up as a, as a French maid. Yes, you because were. Because because I wasn't, um, it was actually a friend of ours, uh, uh, 40th birthday, and, and he all... See, I've forgotten all the details. Yeah. <laughs> all the smart women uh, in his life had been invited to this very formal dinner, and a friend of mine and I uh, wanted to go, and, but they wouldn't have let us, let us, they wouldn't have let us go. I, it seemed to be <laughs> Italian. Uh, they, they wouldn't let us go because... Uh, we were guys, and it was all women with our friend. And so we said, well, if, we'd, if we serve you uh, as the help, we, can we come? And so they made us dress in these French maid <laughs> outfits. And I have to say, I've you... never understood pantyhose. <laughs> <laughs> and I still don't. <laughs> It was, it, was un, it was really unbelievable, yeah, sorry. Well, oh, and, well the thing is, you know, so I, I read this, this book about your, your 61st year, and I can't believe it because I, I'm not, I mean, I think of myself as so much younger. Um, as you are. But well, I'm not at all. Like, I, I'm, I'm going to be 60 in January. Oh. And so you're really blazing this trail for me. Well, I, you know, I don't think th that thinking you're younger is uh, uh, unusual because most of the time um, I'm in full denial of being <laughs> 60 and I think of myself as 20 exactly. nine, 29, yeah. 31, yeah. 33 yeah. perhaps. On some days, 40. <laughs> some days, 157. You know, it, it, it seems to switch. I arrived in Toronto yesterday evening, and I took the new train from the airport. Very exciting. Isn't it fantastic? It's wonderful. Fast, clean, lovely. And then I took a subway train to where I was eventually going, and the, the car doors slammed on my backpack. And when the, the, the train started to move again, I fell forward on all fours, and three very beautiful young people came to my assistance, and one of them called me ma'am. 
And, uh, and, and I've, been, I've been thinking about, well, of course, I've been thinking a lot about your book and about, about aging, and there's, there's a lot I identify with. But honestly, Ian, it wasn't until yesterday that I really thought I was going to be 60 next year because of the ma'am. Really? Yeah. That's the first time it's happened to you? It is the, it is the, <laughs> no, so it you is see, the first time. That's not, that's not what I meant. <laughs> that's, that's really not what I meant. I mean, I mean, that just proves my point that you look so much younger than you are. <laughs> so lovely. Skating. So deft. You know, so deft. Um, no, the problem, I have a friend, for instance, I, I, every, I write about this in the book, uh, at Christmas, some old guys from high school, we all get together, and um, it, it is always, somebody has been offended uh, because, uh, oh, you know, uh, on the subway, someone got up and said to my friend Tim Birmingham, mm. Uh, mm -hmm. who's a lawyer and a brilliant, brilliant yoga guy. He's been doing yoga right. for 15 years. He yeah. teaches yoga. He can put you know, his legs <laughs> behind his head. Uh, he's 60. And he was on the subway, and a young woman saw him come in. And he, you know, he's sort of, he looks like me. And she saw him, and she said, oh, sir, would you like my seat? And he's, <laughs> he said he had to fight off the impulse to say, no, but would you like me to show you how I can put my legs behind my head? <laughs> This is how you get into trouble yeah. as a 60-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you do these wonderful Facebook posts, and, and this becomes a book. As you hold it in your hand, how do you feel about it? I'm Don't not... take me too literally on that, right? <laughs> Good one. Um, I, you know, I have to say... Uh, uh, I'm of two. <laughs> this is why the CBC would never let us work together. And I, I don't know, Ian. You you do something to me. You do. No, no, no. It's it's completely mutual. Believe me. I think they almost threw us off the air. At one yes, point they did at one point for yeah. uh, for uh, untoward conversation. Uh, no, the problem is, you know, this is the thing you. It, this is a, I'm used to writing about other people. Yeah. So you yes. go in and you describe Justin Trudeau, you know, you describe Jerry Butts, his assistant, you say he has a kind of, uh, looks as though he was carved by hand out of a piece of wood, you know. You can describe somebody else. This is a diary, so I'm describing mm -hmm. myself, and so right. it feels um, um, illegal, and it feels um, uh, too revealing, and it's... Uh, it's altogether terrifying. And in, in, in fact. I don't know why I'm here, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> the examined life worth living? Is the examined life worth living? The examined life Did worth Did you enjoy examining your own life? Yes. I, I think the unexamined life is not worth examining. And, <laughs> and, that's, no, seriously. That's not in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, no way. You know, this is the great thing about, I found that as I was getting older, um, because I'm a, you know, neurotic uh, idiot, that I kept trying, and everything becomes an actuarial thing. You, this hasn't happened to you yet because you're not 60, but if, if you're over 60, you start to conduct that actuarial analysis of everything. So you have books. You're going to cull your books. Well, which books are you going to throw out? Well, not that one, because you might read that, at, well... Probably mm. won't read that again, actually, yeah. because I've only got time to read a thousand books. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's yeah. if I'm reading nonstop, <laughs> starting <laughs> as soon as this is over. Right. Yeah. So, so you're constantly um, having to make these um, existential choices. And my reaction, my first reaction, was to speed up and to say, "Well, I just have to do. I, I want to read." Uh, uh, Ulysses and uh, Moby Dick uh, and um, uh, War and Peace again. Uh, obviously, I've read them all before. Uh, you know, I, I really want to read all of those, so I've really got to speed up and, and zoom through. It's like Woody Allen said, you know, War and Peace, they sped read it. It's about Russia. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like that. Yeah. And you're just, yeah. you're just blasting through. And then you realize you can't remember what you've done because <laughs> you have, quite apart from the fact you can't remember anyway, you've skipped over all these details. Yeah, and the yeah. details are actually the glue of your episodic memory. And so uh, what I discovered is that counterintuitively, the thing you have to do is pay attention mm. 
to the stuff that actually grabs you right. as opposed to the stuff that's supposed to grab you yeah. or that you think should be grabbing you if you were a serious or more important person or something like that. So you, I mean, and that's, that was the great part because I could get mm -hmm. up in the morning and I could look out and I could see at one point uh, the ocean mm -hmm. and I could describe the ocean and I could think about my dog and how when I first got the dog, when Johanna, my wife who is here, who is sitting right there, uh, and my daughter, they bought the dog Ginny, uh, a border terrier, they said, we want a dog. I said, no dog. The dog is unimportant. And uh, I don't have time for a dog. I'm too busy. I'm, I've, I've got too much to do, too much to read, too much to think about, too much to write about. No dog. And I said, I don't even want to, and they convinced me to get the dog. And, and I said, I don't want to know the dog's name. <laughs> But now, now the dog sleeps on the pillow beside me. <laughs> and if she's not there, I pull her up, you know? And that's, I, I would have thought that was a bad sign, you know, to, to want the dog. But because of this, I got to write about what was actually in front of me. I mean, as a journalist, you spend so much time writing about what's supposed to be important as opposed yeah. to what is actually grabbing and significant. Mm -hmm. And this was the antidote to that, I suppose. You, um, you could have taken a jaunty approach to turning 60 that you, you talk about, you know, could, could, the, the kind of approach that could have been featured in the Huffington Post, for example. Mm. But sexy at 60. Sexy at 60, for example. Younger next year. Exactly. Yeah. But, but your, your Complete approach... Complete BS. Is, <laughs> it, it isn't that. It, it, did you decide that you, you would pursue a certain kind of tone, a certain kind of mood? No, I, I tried, the, pr the pr trouble I had was I kept, I, ke I would read f poetry, Philip mm -hmm. Larkin, yeah. I would read philosophy, uh, and that was, you know, death is on the way. Like poets, <laughs> and, you know, and novelists too, you know, death is coming, D death is around the corner. You, you will not live, you will not get out of this alive, you know, as, as Philip Larkin said, you know, most things won't happen, that yeah. one will. <laughs> <laughs> Really, and that's, that's dire. On the other hand, you have this self-help literature, which is obviously written by people who are high, because they're, <laughs> they're saying things like, you know, oh, you can be younger next year, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, I kept, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, Johanna, my wife, told me uh, this great, uh, st reminded me of this great story, and uh, th I remember her telling me this while I was thinking about writing this diary. And she had interviewed uh, Kenneth Branagh. And Kenneth Branagh, you know, the film director. And uh, he was making Sleuth. And uh, the remake of Sleuth, right? With Jude Law and Michael Caine playing the role that Laurence Olivier played in the original one. And Harold Pinter, who's a hero of mine, uh, the English playwright, had written the script. And so one day, uh, uh, Branagh uh, got a call at the end of the day, uh, end of day of shooting, and it was it was Pinter, and he was very upset. He said, "I've just seen the the the, the what do they call those things? The uh, the rushes. I've just seen the rushes at the end of the day, and uh, Jude uh, has the gun pointed at him. The young man point uh, gun is pointed at him. He's sniveling on the floor. It's all wrong, all wrong." And and uh, Branagh said, "Well, why is it all wrong? I mean, he's a young man. He's got a gun pointed at. Him. He thinks he's going to die. Why wouldn't he be sniveling?" And and. Um, uh, um, Pinter said, let me tell you something about death. <laughs> you can either be crawling on the floor, sniveling when you face death, you can, be, you can be cringing and creeping along terrified, or you can say, fuck death, <laughs> fuck death. And he, he would say it in such a way that he had more of his tongue out of his mouth than he had in his mouth. And I mean, and literally, it, it, you know, Johanna told me that story, and every day I would wake up and I would either be Jude Law <laughs> sniveling on the ground, or I would be Harold Pinter saying, fuck that. <laughs> and I, I literally could not keep track. <laughs> Did something happen? <laughs> In any event, you know, that's why I thought, if I keep a diary, maybe I can actually slow 
detail down enough that I can, I can actually watch, I can see time going by, as opposed to just looking back and seeing that it's all you know, flooded past you, unnoticed. You, you write about um, the Norwegian writer whose name I'm about to blow, uh, Ove Knausgaard. Can, uh, Ove, uh, Carl Ove Knausgaard. Carl Ove Knausgaard, okay. So, and, and there he is writing very granular detail about his life, but does this amazing trick of, of something's happening here, but, there's, but everything's happening all at once. All his memory comes to bear. Yeah. And, and he is so good that his writing, you, you don't envy him. He is so good. Yeah. But as he is, is doing this granular examination of his life, were you, were you thinking about Knausgaard as well as you were doing a, a granular examination of your life? Well, he's a Norwegian. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So, he's very tall. He, he's very handsome. Uh, so, no. I, did, I, <laughs> I did not think of myself as Carl Ovi. Although I wanted to be Carl Ovi. Now, the problem... I was, you know, Carl Ove now is it's, it's six volumes, right? Mm -hmm. It's 500 pages of volume. Yeah. And I mean, that's a lot of remembering. Yes. Um, so, but I was fascinated by the way he, he describes, for instance, he says, when you're a kid, everything seems so brilliant. Everything seems so memorable. You, you step out of the bus on a winter day and you see the girls in their snowsuits, and the snow has melted on the shoulder, and there's a damp spot, and you see the puddles lying on the ground that you have to jump around, and you see the, stuff, the snow falling from the trees. And he just described what was in front of him. I mean, the trick is that he also makes it into a very compelling narrative. All right? So he, he adds narrative structure to his, quote, diary. But, but he said what he was interested in was voice. He got mm. tired of everything being a narrative, that mm. it, there's so many stories around. He just wanted a voice to carry him through. What he doesn't, you know, the trick is that he has a narrative anyway. But that, that ability to see the resonating, mm. memorable thing mm. in the most apparently unmemorable thing was what struck me. And I, mm. thought, I thought, I've got to try it. I've got to at least try it, you know, uh, before I go back to the Globe and Mail, and, uh, which is a daily newspaper. Uh, you know, Canada's rational newspaper, as I like to call it. You know, the, and you know what it's like. I mean, you've worked at the CBC, and it's not much better there. And, you know, that there's, there is this compulsion to tell you what matters and what's important. I mean, that's the trick, right? For how much is the globe now? Two bucks. Mm. You know, for two bucks, they will tell you everything you need to know about the world. Mm. And of course, it's, it's a lie. Mm. You know, what you need to know about the world is, at least I thought, at this age, is on a completely different level of significance. Mm. Your attention, has, has your attention changed? Is that, uh, do you have a more muscular attention? I beg your pardon, what did you just say? <laughs> I honestly, I don't know why I, this happens. I can't uh, remember. So, no, but, I'll tell you what has changed. I, what has changed is, and this really surprised me because I thought it's, you know, all, I have a lot of women friends who are older, and, and I would say to them, you know, are you looking forward to, old, to getting older? And they would say, well, yes and no. I don't want to be invisible. Yeah. You know, and, and, I, and I, you know, they would turn 50 and they would say, I feel invisible. But they would say, but, you know, I'm, I'm a woman trying to make it in the professional world. I know what feeling invisible is like. You know, that's a mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And, and they would say, and, but what I'm really looking forward to is after uh, uh, menopause, is being freed from desire. Mm. Yeah. I don't have to worry about sex anymore, you know, because I'm never going to have sex again. It's, you know. <laughs> and they would say this, you know, and I would think, that can't be good, <laughs> like, uh, not having sex again. But what I have found with desire, the, and this is really weird, is I always thought I was... Uh, attracted to a, a Catholic range, you know, in other words, a wide range of, of <laughs> stimuli. <laughs> like a very wide range. What I've found since I've, I've turned 60 is I'm attracted to an even wider range. <laughs> so before, I might have been attracted to tall, slim brunettes like Johanna. 
now, you, you wear a kneecap, bring it on, you know? <laughs> like, you could, be wearing, you could be wearing a propeller beanie, and I would find you, you know? And it, I mean, that's, yeah. but is that the yeah. same for women? As a representative, you mean, of the... <laughs> <laughs> yes, as a representative of your entire gender. Wow, yeah. at, at, at my age. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes? <laughs> Thank you. So, someone uh, appropriated my voice in the audience. I think it changes. It changes. You know, it's not as hot. Is What's it? not as hot? Well, the sting of desire. Oh, the sting, the sting of desire is not so sharp. It's not as, well, it's not as hot. Uh, it's not as, st I think, uh -huh. it's, it's not maybe not as stinging. Right, that's true. Yeah, yeah. you find that's true. But it's but it's more uh, it's more enjoyable. Yeah, because when it's so hot, you're always worried you're going to burn yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't>... Well said. <laughs> you you still scalded are... comes to mind. <laughs> Would you like to talk more about sex? <laughs> if you wish to. I, I would you like to talk about sex? Well, yes, I would. But, but we're, you know, we're, we're about halfway through our conversation, and there's still alcohol and we're, tobacco. We're still, we're still and in four pot And skiing and golfing and all those things that you do with your body. Yeah. There's many. You're, you're very physically active. You, you really rush for it. Are we still talking about sex? Yes. <laughs> Exactly. Yes, my glasses just fell. That I, means I'm, I, I'm abandoning I, this I, beautifully crafted set of questions. I take that as a great compliment that your glasses <laughs> fell off. You see, that, you see, when oh, you're 60, yeah. that's a compliment. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. I knocked your glasses off. Okay, let, me, let me tell you why my glasses fell off, because they fogged up. And then they slid down my nose. That's yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. So now that you you know where I'm at, <laughs> I like reading about sex. You, you do. Yeah, do. I do. Yes. Yeah. I, um, I, I, per, perhaps even more than you know the thing. Than actually doing it. Yeah. Well, the, the problem is when you're older, of course, it's more harrowing. Yes. Um, uh, and I mean harrowing in the in the sense that not the actual. Farming, <laughs> harrowing. You write about your father, and you and your mm. father were, were very close. And mm. he died a couple of years ago at 99, mm. and you became close to him after your mother died. Um, 99's a big number, mm. right? And he, his, his, his life was long. And I wonder how his life has shaped your view of what's ahead for you. That's a complicated question. Um, he, um, you know, my dad meant uh, a, a, a great deal to me, and he was a very capable guy uh, right up until the end. I mean, he was going to work three or four times a week when he was 98 years old. Uh, he played squash until he was 88. Uh, he, he drove until he was 93 and, and, and had his license and tried to drive until he was 96. <laughs> And it's too bad the, the self-driving car did not exist for him exactly. because, yeah. you know, he yeah. would have been the... Per but he was... Um, when, when, and he, you know, most... It used to be that a man's life, anyway, the, you, it was a bell curve, right? You, you grew, you, you reached a peak, and then you had a long, slow, and fairly painful decline, or a short or decline. But, but, you know, there was a long downturn. Nobody exercised, or they ate their own. Whereas he had a kind of rectangularized life. He... He was a brilliant athlete. He up long, and then at the very end, he had a short and very sharp decline. And he hated the decline. He hated not being useful, and he hated most of all not being able to use his body, because his body. And he was a you know a world class athlete. I mean, he was a really, really, really graceful guy. And he hated the fact that I had to help him into his chair. Yeah. You know. And I didn't hate that. I loved that in a secret way because. I got to help him. I got to return the favor right. yeah. of his, you know, I have a picture of him drying me when I'm a little boy, little tiny boy, and he's 
got the towel on. We used to play this game, and he would say, where is Willie? He used to call me Willie. And he would say, where is Willie Brown? And, uh, you know, and my mother would say, I don't know, I can't see him. And my father would say, where, where is Willie Brown? And he'd have me, and I'd be, you know, I, this was fantastic. I love that. You know, it was just the greatest game. And I've got a picture of that because my, my dad, you know, your, your mother is part of you. Right? You, know, you come from your mother. Mm -hmm. She's part of your body that you left behind. And, and, and that's, that's the way it is. Whereas your dad is not like that, but he's your companion. You know, he guides you. And when he goes, you don't notice it at first, especially if he's a good father, because you know, th th that's the trick of being a father is to make your kids go on without you. To, right. you, know, you fail them and, and they're, they're not disappointed. But mm -hmm. you do notice that you suddenly don't have this companion mm -hmm. anymore, this guy mm -hmm. beside you. At the end, you know, when he died, I mean, it's, there's so much in this book about him, but mm -hmm. when he died three days later, this robin mm -hmm. showed up in my yard. Mm -hmm. You know, and my dad was pretty well dressed. He was English, you know, good suits and that kind of thing. He always wore a tie, even to uh, go to the doctor, you know, because mm -hmm. he thought it was an act of respect. You know, the doctor knew a lot, and he didn't know as much, and so he wore his tie to, sh to show his obedience to the doctor, or his, his honor of the doctor. Anyway, the, the bird, the robin, showed up in the backyard, and it walked right up the back step, and it sort of stuck its chest out and mm. looked at me and said, what the hell are you up to? Mm. You know, and I thought, I didn't think it was him. I'm not that. But didn't you kind of hope? I wanted it, it to be. be. I, yeah. I, if it were yeah. him, it would be. At, anyway, at the end of, at the end of, this is a very long rambling, um, unlike all the other answers. <laughs> uh, but he, at the end of, his life, he said to me, don't get old, don't get old. You know, many, many, many parents, I'm sure, have said that to people here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I didn't understand what he was trying to say, because of course I'm going to get old. But I think what he was trying to say to me in his kind way is, you will get old, mm -hmm. you know, you will get old. And if you can forgive me for my needing you, then you can be forgiven too for the need you, you will have. And that, I, you know, I, I, of, of the many, many things getting older is, I mean, it's thrilling, it's liberating, it's, it makes you work harder, it makes you work deeper. But, but most of all, I think it, it's uh, training mm. in compassion. It, it teaches you that you, whatever you have, you didn't get it on your own as Obama said to Mitt Romney, you know, you did not yes. make this yourself. You had help. Mm -hmm. And it's a give and take situation. And if you're lucky, you get a chance to, to help him out, you know. I mean, everybody says, oh, my dad's, my parents are getting older. It's such a pain in the ass, you know. They're constantly, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, you actually get to know them. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's thrilling in a weird way. You, you write, at 60, I think I may finally recognize love. What did you mean? Well, that it's not something you can put your finger on, and that it comes along and uh, introduces itself to you in unexpected ways. Um, you know, all, all the time, I'm trying to think of um, uh, Oh, you know, um, if you were to say to me, you know, how do you know you love your wife? Um, 20 years ago, I would have said, eh, sometimes I can tell, you know. Like, you know, you're 40, you're working hard, you've got kids, you're exhausted, you know, and you, you know you love each other. But you, now, if you said to me, how do you know, I would say, well, because uh, we often lie in bed, uh, side by side, um, trying to outpun each other. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, you know, when I say it, I think, what's happened to you, man? You know, <laughs> you've lost your mojo. But, but I, I guess it's the, po the, the possibility that you can come to those conclusions now because you don't have to be tied to, to whatever that that treadmill, you, whatever. I don't, still don't know what it was about. I'm still trying to figure it out, but, 
but you don't have to be on it anymore. And, uh, and so the, the, the pleasures are there for you to take if you can see them. I'm going to stop there. I, I don't want to, but I think I have to. My Fitbit tells me that it's quarter to eight. You see, you wear a Fitbit. I do. So do you know how many steps you've taken today? <laughs> Not offhand, but I can tell you. It's been 12,749. Well. <laughs> so you, you've obviously been stepping out. I, indeed, I have. Very nicely said. No, I, I do it because uh, I, I feel that it, it gives me endorphins. And I used to take antidepressants, and I don't take them anymore. So wow. I'm very, that makes me happy. Obviously, moderate case of depression that can be helped by daily exercise. But this is, it is my drug, I guess, now, you know. And so, yes, I do, I wear this thing. And it, you know, measures also my heart rate. Would you like to know that as well? I, uh... it's, it's high. <laughs> and... <laughs> I, so is mine. <laughs> it's 114 decent. Wow. I, I know that's really embarrassing. Really. No, no, but this is the, t you know, I, one of the things I, I did when I was writing this book is I decided to read about the decay of the body. <laughs> Why would you choose to do that? But even, you know, among the things, you know, your ears get bigger, your, your nose, nose gets bigger. Your yeah. nose because it loses yeah. elastin and it begins to droop. Your, your penis does not get bigger. Thank God for that, because I wouldn't <laughs> want it to. Thank, thank God for that, exactly. Yeah, that's a great answer to that. Thank God for that. But, but the, um, what were you talking about before I can't remember? <laughs> oh, your heart rate. So even, even your blood slows down. Like, even your circulation right, slows down. Yeah. Like some of these th things, are, and it all starts at 28, right? So your brain expands to your 28, and then it starts to shrink. By 35, the elastin in your skin is practically gone. By 39, the, the mineral content of your bones is declining, and the ash content, nicely named, is, 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 on, is, the, is on the increase. You know, it, it's, I mean, and I'm reading all this stuff, and I'm thinking, oh, this is terrible, but the real thing that I'm thinking is of all those 31-year-old shits, you know, at, 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 not at work, but in other places, <laughs> who imply that I'm some, you know, inept buffoon because I'm, I'm and I, I just want to say, you know, you're older than you think, you know? <laughs> I, I think, you know, this, this is, it's such a, a wonderful book. I know I'm going to, I am going to carry it with me, I mean, inside me, um, for a very long time. And, uh, <laughs> and I think that the biggest lesson for me is about attention and keeping your eyes open to, to what's happening or you'll miss a lot along the way. Yeah. That's a very good lesson. And, and it's, and it, as, you know, and it, it turns out it's the stuff that really is yeah. so... Great. I mean, Nicholson Baker, who yeah, I mean, know you yeah. know, uh, was a brilliant, brilliant writer. He once, I said to him, what do you write about? And he said, well, sometimes I, can't, I don't have anything to write about. I said, well, so then what do you do? He goes, well, I try and remember the best thing that happened to me yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I said, really? That sappy? I mean, you start with the best thing that happened? He said, oh, yeah. He said, I always get to the bad thing anyway in, in thinking about But he just begins at that point. And when you, it's a fascinating exercise because if you, if you actually think what the best thing was that happened yesterday, mm -hmm. there's probably five candidates, right? And deciding which of the candidates and why, I mean, that's, that's a chapter. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, just working that mm -hmm. through is endlessly interesting. As is this book, and thank you for this conversation, oh, thank, okay, honestly. Thank you. Ian Brown.